all. I am Dr. Vishnu. So I am happy to inaugurate a new series that is regarding amazing facts about medications. Before that, uh, I would like to thank all of you. We have reached 1,000 subscribers. Uh, to be very frank, there was no unnecessary publicity, no any unwanted content or any kind of thumbnail which will give a false impression. So it was all total crude productive knowledge that I have been trying to share for the past seven months. I do agree to the fact that my videos are not very colorful because uh, it is just a PowerPoint presentation on the background of which I'm talking. And yes, it is detailed. So that is why the duration will be long. But I can definitely guarantee you that if you keep the patience and listen to my videos from the starting till the end, you will definitely get lots of knowledge, which I term it as practical knowledge. So... I decided to start a new series that's regarding amazing fact about medications. So talking about this presentation, every day I will be posting five important facts about any five medications. So it will be like any five medicines, what is interesting about them. Means all the things that are interested, interesting about a particular medication I will not share. Something that is catchy, something that is one or two points that are catchy. So you will understand my method as the presentation goes on and on. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you all for subscribing and believing in my efforts. And if you support my view, then please do share and subscribe to Maximum People. So let's without uh, wasting any time going to the presentation. So if you look at the scope of this presentation, why this presentation? Like any of my presentation, like 35 videos are there in my channel. You can just check it out. So basically when I, I usually talk to a lot of people through call, through WhatsApp, or maybe through LinkedIn, I usually have a talk with a lot of people. And many people, the most important thing that they say is, they are not getting practical knowledge exposure. Now, obviously, I don't have a hospital so that I can invite people there and get them exposed to practical skills or something. But what I learned from my life is, even if I'm not getting proper hospital exposure, it doesn't mean that I should not learn anything practical. So I this is my own hypothesis based on my experience in life, as in how I gain my practical knowledge and memory. So to get practical knowledge, there are two options. First is to practically see. That is what you usually do. For example, you are a clinical pharmacist. For example, you are working in internship, clerkship, or maybe hospital duties. So definitely you are seeing a lot of cases and you are learning something from them. For example, you are learning the dose of a medication. Maybe you are learning why a particular medicine is used in a particular condition, etc., etc. So that is practically see. Practically visualize is more important. For example, in your syllabus, there is a chapter known as leukemia. But in your hospital, there is no case of leukemia. Maybe there is no oncology department in your hospital. Does it mean that you should not know about leukemia or the medications used in leukemia? Absolutely not. You should know. So how are you going to retain that memory? Or how are you going to study leukemia in an interesting way rather than studying it in the theoretical manner? So that is what I have written here. Read about a medication's effects and correlate it with other consequences. So the other consequences can be positive or negative. So I have given examples for it. Minoxidil, you know very well that it was initially used as an antihypertensive, but then its side effect came up that it causes hypertrichosis, that is abnormal hair growth. That is why we have minoxidil shampoos nowadays, which is used for hair loss. So it is a positive consequence. Positive consequence means although this drug causes a side effect, it is that side effect is used for a positive indication. 
proton pump inhibitors cause hypomagnesemia so this is very important proton pump inhibitors cause hypomagnesemia that may cause insomnia and depression now depression is very interesting please remember if you are a person who is suffering from depression if you are a person who is suffering from uh, anxiety related problems there can be magnesium deficiency magnesium is also important actually the most important is vitamin d vitamin d is very important vitamin b1 is very important but zinc iron and magnesium are also important so if there is hypomagnesemia if magnesium deficiency is there in your body then you may suffer from depression because magnesium helps in regulating your mood and also magnesium helps you to fall asleep so if magnesium level reduces it may cause insomnia and it may cause depression so this is a negative consequence because it is a side effect so obviously it doesn't mean that all the ppi in the world whoever whoever is consuming ppi currently they are all suffering from insomnia and depression it depends on lot of factors how long are you taking it whether you are having any other risk factor that can predispose you to insomnia or depression lot of things you know depend but and it is also not necessary that you go to the hospital and see a case in which a patient who is taking a proton pump inhibitor necessarily has insomnia and depression it's not necessary but if you look theoretically proton pump inhibitors cause hypomagnesemia so you can directly go and read the functions of magnesium in the body so you can make a prediction yourself this is called practically hypothesize or practically visualize so let's come to the first uh, catch point why do ssris cause sexual dysfunction so there are two reasons behind it first reason is ssris first of all you need to know they are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors which are used in the treatment of depression anxiety disorder to some extent uh, post traumatic stress disorder etc etc so ssris they usually stimulate 5hp type 2 receptors in the spinal cord so that is the reason why it causes erectile dysfunction in males and delayed ejaculation and that is exactly the reason why ssris may be used for premature ejaculation again it is not an approved indication it is an off label use off label use means it is used by some physicians but it has not been approved by a medical organization or a medical body so there is an example known as dapoxetin so dapoxetin is used in the treatment of premature ejaculation due to the side effect of ssri in which they cause erectile dysfunction and delayed ejaculation so from this you can actually create a practical knowledge of your own if a newly married couple either the male or the female especially the male is suffering from depression and is consuming an ssri family planning schemes should be carefully taken into consideration because it causes erectile dysfunction and delayed ejaculation which may hamper their family planning strategies another reason always remember dopamine gives you sexual feelings whatever feelings you have it can be happiness uh, it can be anger it can be psychotic behavior aggressive behavior it can be sexual romantic feelings all these things are given by dopamine so there is a receptor in our body which is known as 5ht2c receptor 5ht2 type c receptor they actually reduce the level of dopamine for this you can refer my a uh, video on antidepressants in that i have explained receptor pharmacology in that i have said what is the effect of 5ht2c receptor so 5ht2c receptor actually reduces the level of dopamine and dopamine gives you sexual feelings if ssris activate 5ht2c receptors then dopamine levels might get reduced which can again lead to anorgasmia sexual dysfunction etc 
So this is an interesting aspect of SSRI in which sexual dysfunction is a side effect. And we try to analyze the reason behind which this may happen. Why do anticholinergics cause fever as a side effect? Always remember, cholinergic system activates your secretions. Anticholinergics block your secretions. Always remember this. Cholinergic system increases your secretions. Anticholinergic system blocks your secretions. So our body eliminates toxins like it can be urine, it can be fecus, it can be sweat as well. Anticholinergics block secretions of our body, which also includes sweat. So the sweat glands are also blocked. So if sweat is not produced, then the toxins stay inside our body. So that can lead to fever as a side effect. So if a patient is reporting of having unexplained fever, they should also be evaluated if they are under anticholinergic therapy or if they are taking any medication or medications that have anticholinergic side effects. For example, tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, desipramine, imipramine, etc. They have anticholinergic side effects. Thioridazine. Thioridazine is a first generation antipsychotic First generation, low potency antipsychotic. Low potency means its affinity towards the dopamine receptor is very poor. Actually, first generation antipsychotics are classified into two. One is high potency and the other is low potency. High potency means the affinity towards the dopamine receptor will be more. Low potency means the affinity towards the dopamine receptor will be less. So in high potency, what happens? Anticholinergic side effects are usually not seen. But in low potency, anticholinergic side effects are seen. So thioridazine comes under low potency, first generation antipsychotic. And that is why anticholinergic side effects are usually seen. So this is an interesting aspect in which anticholinergics can actually cause fever as a side effect. Why can amiodarone cause both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism? So this is also interesting. In some books, you will find that it causes hypothyroidism. In some books, you will find that it causes hyperthyroidism. So amiodarone is an analog of thyroid hormone, which actually contains iodine. Now let's first try to understand why amiodarone causes hypothyroidism. If amiodarone is given to patients who live in normal thyroid regions, the iodine inside amiodarone will block the release of thyroid hormones. So that can cause hypothyroid. So for example, you are a person who is having normal thyroid levels. You are a person who is having normal thyroid. Means you are not neither having hyper nor having hypo. So if you are a person who is having normal thyroid levels and if amiodarone is administered inside you, the iodine inside amiodarone will block the release of thyroid hormones which can cause hypothyroidism. But if amiodarone is given to patients who are having iodine deficiency or who stay in iodine deficiency regions, the iodine will bind with thyroid or the thyroid will accept the iodine inside amiodarone and that will increase the production of thyroid hormones, which causes hyperthyroidism. So this is very interesting. If amiodarone is given to a patient who is staying in a place where there is iodine deficiency, in that condition, the iodine which is inside amiodarone will be taken by thyroid and that will increase the production of thyroid hormones. So that can lead to hyper thyroidism. So since most people live in euthyroid regions, euthyroid means normal thyroid regions, hypothyroidism is more common than hyperthyroidism. So here I have explained two reasons why amiodarone can cause both hypo and hyperthyroidism. Why SSRIs cause diarrhea? So again, we are coming to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Why they cause diarrhea? 
So I have written in the uh, pathophysiological steps. So first SSRI, they activate 5-HT4 receptors in the gut, in the stomach. So when 5-HT4 receptors are activated, acetylcholine production increases. Just now, sometime before I was talking about anticholinergics, so I told you that acetylcholine increases the secretion of our body and anticholinergic blocks all the secretions. So when acetylcholine production increases, GI contraction increases. So whenever you have diarrhea, always remember whenever you have increased bowel movement, that happens due to increased GI contractions. So acetylcholine will increase gastrointestinal contractions, which will increase the bowel movement leading to diarrhea. In anticholinergic, what happens is that they reduce the GI contractions. So as a result of which constipation is observed among anticholinergics. Now we come to the last important catch point that is regarding levodopa. Some facts about levodopa. Levodopa stimulates beta-1 receptor which can lead to arrhythmia. But usually it is not very commonly seen. The risk reduces when it is used along with carbidopa. Anyways, very rarely we will see any hospital or any clinic in which levodopa is given alone. You know very well that levodopa cannot be given alone to uh, patient because it is easily broken down by dopa decarboxylase enzyme. So usually we give levodopa along with carbidopa. So levodopa stimulates beta-1 receptor. So first of all, we need to know the functions of beta-1 receptor. Beta-1 receptor usually increases your heart rate. So if levodopa is stimulating beta-1 receptors, it can cause tachycardia, which can lead to arrhythmia. But the risk is less if it is used along with carbidopa. Levodopa stimulates alpha-1 receptor, which can cause hypertension and worsen BPH in elderly. The risk reduces when used along with carbidopa. So you need to understand that alpha-1 and alpha-2 are enemies. Alpha-1 receptor increases noradrenaline production. Alpha-2 receptors reduce noradrenaline production. So if levodopa is stimulating alpha-1 receptor, it will definitely cause hypertension because noradrenaline is produced. And alpha-1 receptors are also found in the prostate gland which can cause benign prostatic hypertrophy, especially in elderly. This is usually BPH is found in elderly. So that is why we use alpha-1 blockers in the treatment of BPH. So since levodopa stimulates alpha-1 receptor, it may worsen BPH in elderly. So for example, it's a 60-year-old male who is suffering from BPH and also suffering from Parkinson's disease. And if levodopa is given to that patient, then it may worsen the BPH. This is just a hypothetical data because of the reason that it stimulates alpha-1 receptor. But again, the risk reduces when used along with carbidopa. Levodopa is a precursor of melanin. So melanin, you know very well, they are important pigments in our body. So if you are having melanin, a good amount of melanin in your body, it will protect you from the UV rays of the, and it also protects you from some kind of cancers also. But if melanin is very high in your body, that is also another headache because it may cause malignant melanoma. And levodopa is actually a precursor of melanin. So you have to be very careful if you are using levodopa in a patient who is suffering from malignant melanoma. So for example, you can derive a practical scenario like a patient is suffering from Parkinson's disease and they are also suffering from malignant melanoma. And if you are giving levodopa, you should be very careful and you should check for the prognosis of malignant melanoma, like how the patient is responding to the treatment used in melanoma. So these are five different interesting catch points that I had to share today.
i hope this video it's a short video this has been informative for you if you find this informative and if you find my efforts worthwhile then please do subscribe and share to maximum people because it takes a lot of hard work to actually gather the information make notes and convert into powerpoint and since i'm doing this free of cost i definitely believe that this message should go to maximum people so and also the thing is that knowledge is power and knowledge shared is knowledge doubled thank you so much for listening to me see you in the next video until then it's goodbye